lesson after lesson in, in diet has proven wrong, right? Avoid saturated fat. Avoid total fat. Eat more healthy whole grains. Use more corn oil. Use more mixed vegetable oil. I mean, over and over and over, the conventional advice is not only proven ineffective, it's proven harmful. Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. A very special podcast today because I have none other than William Wheatbelly Davis, a cardiologist extraordinaire who has incredible knowledge patient experience and huge quantities of research all around heart disease but in recent years going way beyond heart disease so it's an honor to meet you finally directly william oh thank you ivor i'm i'm, I'm glad to be here excellent well the first question i was going to start with and actually, I won't start with the question yet. I just want to talk a little around my sponsor, David Bobbitt, who I know you are very well familiar with. And you were a huge support to him, along with many other top cardiologists back in 2012, when he had discovered he had enormous heart disease, even though he was acing all his ECGs, treadmills. He had a score of nearly 1,000 calcium, and he had three primarily blocked arteries. So maybe we could have a quick word about that story. It, well, it, his David's story uh, I were, is, is a great illustration of how ridiculous the conventional approach to heart disease is, which is treat your cholesterol, this lousy, outdated uh, uh, marker for the uh, factors that actually do cause heart disease, that should have been abandoned, by the way, 40 years ago, but still in use because the statin drug industry profits from that ridiculous uh, piece of misinformation. And so they use cholesterol values and the development of symptoms to determine whether you have heart disease or not. Well, that's ridiculous because when, the, when symptoms appear, you're in deep trouble. Uh, half the people who have a heart attack, for instance, die before they get to the hospital. So we all know this. But the conventional notion is wait till symptoms appear or something like an abnormal stress test, which is a very, very late marker, uh, develop because that's how it pays better. That is, so I, I'm, I was an interventional cardiologist. I was the guy doing stents and angioplasty and uh, atherectomies and all that stuff. I'll tell you, Ivor, it pays great. <laughs> I can get paid several thousand dollars per patient, and I could do several uh, uh, procedures a day. It wasn't uncommon to do six, seven, eight, nine, ten procedures a day, so it paid very well. Why should I be bothered identifying people before they have a catastrophe, a heart catastrophe, and prevent it? Why would they do that? They don't do it. So there's a willing ignorance. There's a willful ignorance. And I really mean that. There is an absolutely willful ignorance in identifying people who are at risk a year, two years, five years for a heart catastrophe because it pays so much better to put in stents, do bypass, do heart catheterization, et cetera. That is the sad state of affairs in heart disease. And so there's very little interest in identifying people beforehand. But that's where the whole world of heart scanning came from. They came from dissatisfied people like David who said, what the hell is going on here? You mean you tell me my cholesterol is fine, I'm slender, I'm a long distance runner, I'm fit, I'm really healthy, yet I have advanced heart disease? Why are we not looking for that? And so he had a CT heart scan, of course, for a coronary calcium score, and he had, as you point out, advanced heart disease. So now the question becomes, why? What can we do about it? Yeah, exactly. And I always, with David, we talk about a two-hander. You must have the early identification of those at risk, so they have an option, a right to know, and an option to take steps. And the second thing is you must do the right stuff, because meds can help somewhat with people who are not going to do the right stuff. But uh, to fix the root causes is the it's the holy grail, essentially. So maybe we could have a word on that. Uh, what in your book undoctored recently it's a tour de force it's very uncompromising on the whole medical system of course and you go through so many drivers of disease and ways to counteract them but for you what are the top several the top few key things to do when you find out you have heart disease and you want to attack the root causes one don't pay any attention to cholesterol. It's ridiculous. It's outdated. It came from 1950s, 1960s understanding of heart disease causation. 
and, and unfortunately, that's all the conventional doctors pay attention to. They think that reducing cholesterol, they think that cholesterol is a you know, wonderful marker and reducing cholesterol is the answer to all heart disease, which of course is absurd. As you have helped point out, uh, cholesterol is a lousy marker. Um, so look, but it, it distracts everybody from the real causes. And that's what shocks me. No one's paying attention to the real causes. So if all you do is reduce cholesterol with a cholesterol-reducing drug like Lipitor, take aspirin and follow a low-fat diet, you have no impact, for instance, on the progression, the rise, the expected rise in a heart scan score. So if we did nothing for these people with positive heart scan scores, as you know, let's say 1,000, let's say around David's score, about 1,000. If you do nothing, the score will be about 25% higher. So 1,250 a year later, and then a year after that, another 25% higher. And of course, the more it progresses like that, the more certain it is you're going to die of a heart attack or uh, have a heart attack or have other uh, uh, coronary syndromes, angina, get a stent, etc. So if you do nothing, the score increases 25% per year. What if you go on aspirin, Lipitor at high dose, or other statin drug, and a low-fat diet. How fast does your heart scan score increase? 25% per year. We helped uh, publish those data 20-some 20 some, 20 some years ago, <laughs> for 20-some years ago, and it's been corroborated repeatedly. Conventional notions of heart disease prevention do nothing for stopping the progression. In fact, may even accelerate it. They may, may even rise faster. So the question becomes, well, how do we stop the otherwise relentless progression? So, by the way, the conventional consensus opinion is uh, don't repeat the heart scan. Just let them have a heart attack or develop symptoms and have them come to the hospital. No kidding. That is the consensus opinion, which is absurd, of course, because that essentially says uh, let them develop symptoms and yet you know, a bunch of people will die as a result. Of, oh, well, what can you do, right? <laughs> so that's when I set about trying to find what does impact progression of heart scan scores. And that's what led to the collection of crazy strategies that I used to call tractor plaque, and then now we call undoctored, though people see this as a means of losing weight and other things. No one wants to talk about heart disease, right? So you're a brave young man because you want to talk about heart disease. Most people don't give a crap about heart disease until something bad happens to them or somebody close to them, but that's what we're doing. So the number one thing we do <clears throat> is eliminate all causes of small LDL particles. Small LDL particles, as you likely know, are unusually persistent. If you consume a food, it's caused by food, uh, it lasts about five to seven days as opposed to the 24 hours of a large LDL particle. So obvious question, what causes small LDL particles that we know are potent causes of coronary atherosclerosis? Two things, grains and sugars, not fat, not lack of statin drugs, but grains and sugars, though amplified by other factors such as insulin resistance and, and, and inflammation, as you've, as you've been very good at pointing out. But First step, eliminate grains and sugars. And if you're following, let's say, NMR lipoproteins, which is just a means of uh, gauging lipoproteins, the real causes of heart disease, not cholesterol, you'll see a small LDL drop, for instance, from 1,800 nanomoles per liter, particle count per volume, to zero or something close to that. So it's not like a statin-like 30% drop. It's an it's a obliteration of this thing that causes uh, heart disease. So diet is crucial. It's, it starts the process of unwinding the expression of small LDL particles. And by the way, when you do that, all this other good stuff happens. HDL goes way up. Triglycerides come way down. Fatty liver regresses. Insulin resistance uh, begins a powerful uh, process of reversal. Blood sugar drops. Hemoglobin A1C drops. <clears throat> C-reactive protein drops. IL-2, other inflammatory markers, drop. So it's not the full answer, but it's the start to a very powerful answer. Vitamin D, when, when I added vitamin D, and this is back, I forget now, 10, 12 years ago, uh, and I didn't do it for coronary purposes, I did it for other purposes, because it was clear, for instance, even back then, that it helped contribute to reversal of insulin resistance, very uh, important thing, and is anti-inflammatory, as you know. What, that was the first time I saw. So up till then, before vitamin D, heart scan scores would increase 25% per year. We threw everything we could at it, fish oil, you know, exercise, blah, blah, blah. And maybe we slowed it to 12%, 18%, 8% per year progression. Added vitamin D was the first time I saw a heart scan score, say, of 900 become 400 or 500 or 300, something like that. And it happened over and over and over again. We saw actual regression of coronary calcium scores. Not to say that vitamin D is the only answer, 
but it became clear that it was a very, very critical component of an effort to pre prevent the progression of at least coronary calcium as an indirect gauge of, of coronary atherosclerotic volume. Yeah, so vitamin D, low carb diets, low sugars, low grains, insulin resistance, abatement, all pretty much key factors. What about vitamin K2, which has got a lot of focus in recent years and trials are beginning and the effect that can have to moderate calcification or possibly even help towards regression? The conversation is tantalizing. I've been dealing with K2 for about a decade now based on the Rotterdam Heart Study, which of course is lousy data because it's observational. We know that observational data, as you've pointed out, is, a, is almost as good as no data at all. Eight times out of 10 observational data are disproven by the true clinical trial data. We know that K2, though, still plays a role in calcium metabolism. We know that from Japan, for instance, where K2, as minotetranone, the MK4 form, is, a, is helpful in reversing osteoporosis, osteopenia. The problem with uh, coronary issues is there's virtually no data outside of experimental and observational data that suggests that K2 plays a role. I'll tell you, when I added K2 as 180 micrograms of the MK7, the long-acting form, or 5,000 micrograms of the MK4 short-acting form, I, this is anecdotal, I never saw any effect whatsoever on uh, contributing any incremental benefit to stopping the progression of heart scan scores, nor on other calcium dependent uh, phenomena such as aortic valve stenosis. And so I'm, I've become skeptical. I, I think what we're dealing with here, Ivor, is, let me, let me digress for a moment, is the same issue we see with homocysteine. So people who have homocysteine know that if you're above 14 micromolar, you're, you have greater in, uh, risk for stroke, heart attack, cancer, depression, right? And we know that we can reduce homocysteine very effectively with B vitamins, B6, B12, and folate, B9. So obvious question, well, what happens when we treat people with high homocysteines with a collection of B vitamins? 15 trials now, you reduce homocysteine 25, 30, 35% with no effect whatsoever on reducing cardiovascular events, stroke, etc. What the heck? So what's wrong with this? Well, could homocysteine be a marker for something else? And I think the, the science is suggesting homocysteine is a marker for dysbiosis, disrupted bowel flora, because lactobacillus and bifidobacteria species are very good. They're very avid producers of B vitamins, especially folate, B6, and B12. So no, no surprise, perhaps, if we buy this idea, that giving people those B vitamins doesn't reduce risk because the, the cause is not the lack of B vitamins. The lack of B vitamins is just an epiphenomenon. It's just a side occurrence. The real issue here is unaddressed substantial dysbiosis like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth where the entire length of the intestine is infected, which is extremely common, by the way. So I wonder if the same issue applies to K2 because we know that there are probably about a half dozen species that convert K1 that is the K1 in green vegetables like kale and spinach, to K2. So is the apparent benefit of K2 really a reflect, is the apparent rise of K2, <laughs> lack of K2, is that really reflective of dysbiosis? And the solution is not give you K2, by giving B vitamins for homocysteine with no effect, is the real solution address the dysbiosis that allows a lack of K2. This is an emerging conversation. I won't pretend to have all the answers, but I think that's where that conversation is going. So I, you, but there's, that all said, there's no harm, as you know, in taking K2. Take your 180 micrograms of, K, of MK7 or take your 5,000 micrograms of MK4. There's no harm. There's never been any harm shown, <clears throat> but there has never been any benefit shown in cardiovascular disease either. So as you point out, those trials are, are being put together, and so we'll have better information soon. Though as often happens, the attention is given to, to products that have a potential pot of gold at the end of the trial, that is some kind of supplement or drug. I wouldn't be surprised if this proves to be a positive trial. The drug companies somehow get hold of it and lock it up with patents. That's how they work. When the real solution is probably more address the, dysbio the universal dysbiosis that all uh, Western Europeans and Americans now have because of all the things we're exposed to. Yeah, William, absolutely. There's trials underway, but there is a, an absolute dearth of human data. And I've been digging into it in the past few weeks. 
got a lot of papers. The only thing besides associational really are animal studies. So there's a series of animal studies where they have antagonists for K2 and they accelerate calcification impressively. And then there's some rat studies where they add high dose K2 and K1 combo, but the standard doses, human corrected, you know, grams per whatever, uh, didn't really do anything, but the high doses had quite a strong effect. But again, animal models, like you say, we got to be really careful with those as well. You know, I have a bias in a lot of the things I do. I always ask if this, if something is beneficial, did primitive humans do it this way and or did they have some means of obtaining this thing? So like vitamin D, you know, I was shocked when I started seeing the effects of vitamin D whenever 10, 12 years ago. Personally, I, I had uh, something close to seasonal affective disorder. I live in Wisconsin where it got dark really early and it got cold and it was extremely depressing. I'd stand in the shower at six in the morning, depressed, thinking I had to go through a day. When I added vitamin D within three days, I felt the entire thing lift. I felt a physical lifting of that, of that feeling. But then you have to ask, well, then how did primitive humans get vitamin D? Well, you know, they, they ran naked or semi-naked in a tropical or subtropical sun. They ate liver. Um, uh, they, they lived outdoors for the most part. We live indoors. We wear clothing that covers 90% of the surface area of our skin. We don't eat liver, unfortunately, things like that. So we all have profound vitamin D deficiency. But in other words, but it's consistent with the primitive human experience with its need programmed into human genetic code. So I always ask, so if there's an apparent benefit of K2, why is that? Is it because we relied on pasture-fed uh, ruminants for their meat and organs? And their, it could be that, but the, con the consumption of, of ruminants uh, has been spotty, and there are populations who don't consume ruminants. <laughs> so uh, it makes me wonder where this need comes from. So I, that's why I'm, I'm getting to the point where could it be, once again, the dysbiosis of modern humans? that we've yet an, it's another expression of how much we've mucked up the microbiome and maybe part of that is the loss of species that convert k1 to k2 i think that's where this is going but this is just my speculation and putting two and two together yeah no that's a perfectly reasonable postulation there and as you said the data is not in yet if you take though uh, your people that vitamin D was so critical in, well, there's a couple of questions. One, and I gave a talk on this some years ago on vitamin D. I was concerned over the years that the D3 pharmaceutical or nutraceutical might not confer the same benefits that achieving D3 through the sun would because of the vasodilation of UV and there's multiple other photo products in the sun. We don't even know what they actually do. So how do you feel about that, trying to get real sun or UV lamps like from Sperty as maybe more favorable than the vitamin D supplements? Yeah, I think that's, that's true. That is, taking vitamin D does not absolve you of the need for sun exposure. I think the best strategy is to take vitamin D, just because it's impractical to get vitamin D from sun, for, from sun from most, at your latitude and my latitude. Uh, it, what if it's February? You can't get D. You could sit outside naked the entire day and still not get vitamin D. So it's, it's impossible and impractical. And something not often talked about, as you get older, you lose the capacity to activate vitamin D in the skin. So uh, taking vitamin D is a partial solution. I think you're right. Getting sun exposure is a better solution, though the means by which that works is not entirely clear. It might be some pineal mechanism. It might be something else. But there seems to be additive effects of sun exposure over and above that. Of uh, Most of that data is observational, by the way, so we have to be careful about that. But you know what? It's, it's benign. And as you know, this ridiculous advice to avoid sun uh, exposure that comes from the dermatology community, as, as often happens in conventional healthcare, conventional advice ruins health. This is true in dermatology. It's true in heart disease. It's true in diet. Conventional advice is wrong and actually uh, uh, ruins health in many ways. And I think that's true also for this idea of avoiding sun exposure. By the way, when you take vitamin D and get your blood levels up into the 60, 70, 80 nanograms per milliliter range, or 150, 180 nanomoles per liter, uh, you are protected, not, not impervious, but protected from sunburn. It's sunburn, of course, that has all the deleterious effects. And we are protected from sunburn. So there's that crazy issue where the better off you are with vitamin D status, the more protected you are from sun excessive sun exposure.
And indeed, increasingly, it's coming out that a lack of vegetable oils in your diet or seed oils makes you much more impervious to the burning effects of the sun and, and all the biochemistry and science is is getting behind that so that's another good one no vegetable oils which i guess of course is one of your big rules as well no seed oils and industrial vegetable oils yeah yeah it, it, it's amazing how much conventional dietary advice has gotten wrong you know i'm kind of grateful for how much they screwed up because it taught us what is true what is not true i mean lesson after lesson in, in diet has proven wrong right avoid saturated fat avoid total fat, eat more healthy whole grains, use more corn oil, use more mixed vegetable oil. I mean, over and over and over, the conventional advice is not only proven ineffective, it's proven harmful. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a vivid illustration of how wrong it, it, things can be, particularly when you allow industry to get involved in decision-making, policy-making. Yeah, for sure. And you know what I used to say years ago, William, that if you took all of these decisions on what good nutritional advice was, and you take seven or eight of them like you've listed, if you flipped a coin, you couldn't get it more wrong. I mean, the only one they can really, I mean, even salt, you know, arguably, telling people to eat very little salt now is a negative thing as well in many people's case. So cigarette smoking was the only one they were really correct on. <laughs> good point. Very good point. Anyway, I love you're an engineer, right? That wisdom is coming from outside healthcare. Wisdom on health is not coming from healthcare. You know, healthcare is designed to maximize revenue return for healthcare insiders, for doctors, medical device in, uh, companies, pharmaceutical industries, the hospital systems. Uh, healthcare is not geared towards providing health. So I love that people like someone outside healthcare saying, what the hell is going on with this ridiculous stuff you're doing? Like take, giving people statin drugs and telling them to lower their fat intake. So it's, it's wonderful. We live in a time. So there's a lot of bad, especially in the U.S. in healthcare. But the great thing here is someone like Ivor Cummins can say, what the hell is going on here? I look at the data as an engineer, and the data has been massively misinterpreted, misrepresented, and leads to the wrong conclusions. And here are the right conclusions. Yeah, hey, thanks, William. Yeah, well, I was kind of hooked from the very start, from the first couple of weeks of research in this, because, you know, compared to engineering, I so rapidly found out so much that was wrong it just became a playground. It was fascinating. But we also got some amazing doctors who are engineers originally. I mean, the, the way of thinking, the thought process, like Dr. Michael Eads, Dr. Ted Naiman, uh, Dr. Bernstein with this type 1 diabetes solution. So there's a load of docs. Now, you yourself, I'll have to say, I don't want to be flattering here, but early in my journey back in 2012, coming into 13, I sat with my wife and watched your original, I think it was AHS possibly, your original talk on wheat. And I was just stunned at a whole series of things that you as a cardiologist had started looking at your patient's degree of disease versus what they were eating, trying to find out where are the patterns. And you saw that cholesterol being high, you could have in a person with uh, very low heart disease or cholesterol low in a, in a person with high heart disease. And you found your way to wheat so quickly. And then again, outside your specialty, you completely researched the whole history and evolutionary and biochemical side of, of wheat. So that was quite amazing. We were just blown away by that lecture. You know, a lot of it, uh, this gets kind of boring. People's eyes glaze over. But, you know, you know, who knows a lot about nutrition? The anthropology community. I'm always astounded how much they know, how much they've learned by uh, tracking the behavior of humans and the impact on health. Now, of course, there's no such thing as fossilized livers, of course. But there's still huge amounts you can extract from the remains of humans going back thousands and then millions of years. And I mean, it's, it's, anthropologists have known this for decades, that when humans first turned to even the ancient form of wheat, einkorn wheat in the Middle East, as well as millet in sub-Saharan Africa, to some degree rice in Southeast Asia, and uh, maize and teas in, in uh, Mesoamerica, Central America, the, the theme repeats itself over and over again. When humans first turned to the seeds of grasses, that's what grains are, uh, there was an explosion in tooth decay. Pri I, I find this fascinating. I'm surprised dentists don't make more of this. Prior to the consumption of grains, dental decay and uh, misaligned teeth were virtually unknown. 
One to three percent of all teeth recovered prior to the consumption of, of grains showed decay, which makes sense. If you're a wild human and you eat some of your food raw, you need a full mouth of intact, strong teeth. When grains were added, 16 to 49 percent of all teeth recovered showed misalignment, tooth decay, tooth abscess. By the way, that same experience is repeated in primitive cultures that have persisted to the modern age who've adopted Western diet. An explosion tooth decay, such that the number one cause for suicide among uh, 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 tribes or cultures living in ancient life, uh, style life, is, um, is tooth abscess because it erodes the surface extremely painful. But we know, the anthropologists know with confidence that when we consume grains, there's an explosion in tooth decay, tooth misalignment, a doubling of knee arthritis, iron deficiency, and other uh, diseases. In other words, it was a dramatic change in human health and human behavior. It did lead to the burst in agricultural activity and perhaps a civilization, so it did some good things as well. But it was a response for a major downturn in human health. And modern people don't recognize that. They think that eating a, a loaf of bread or a sandwich, uh, they don't recognize that that's a major cause for tooth decay, heart disease, autoimmune diseases, uh, metabolic diseases, inflammation, arthritis, psoriasis, seborrhea, <laughs> acid reflux, also of colitis, Crohn's disease, on and on and on. But the realization that this was a mistake, a huge dietary mistake made 10,000 years ago, sets us free to do the opposite. And once again, diet, conventional diet information not only gave us ineffective diet information, it gave us destructive diet information. For sure, doesn't bread just has to be cut out. And I often say to people, when we say junk food, and we mean like a burger or fries, the refined carbohydrates and seed oils, the meat is, is not actually that bad, probably. It's the bun. But then when we talk about bread, we talk about it as healthy whole grains. But constitutively, it's the same seed oils and refined carbohydrates as the stuff we call junk. And no one sees the irony. It is amazing, isn't it? So just because the observational data suggested that people who replace something awful for diet, for diet, white processed flour with something less awful, uh, whole grains, and there's, an, there's a benefit. And by the way, that is true. We all know that's true. There's less colon cancer, less heart disease, less weight gain, less type 2 diabetes. And so, so for instance, my, my favorite example is a nurse's health study, which is a huge epidemiologic study out of the Harvard School of Public Health. They showed over about 10 years that women who ate lots of white processed food gained 12 pounds. For a lot of people, it's a lot more than that, of course, but they gained 12 pounds. Women who ate more whole grains gained 11 pounds. Conclusion, eating whole grains helps manage weight. No, conclusion is <laughs> anything made with grains makes you fat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> white processed food makes you fatter. <laughs> this is the kind <laughs> of logic used over and over and over, by the way, in the epidemiological studies used to support ridiculous notions like eat healthy whole grains. Of course, what they should have done was followed a group prospectively that ate no grains. And of course, they would have shown that there is no weight gain or there's weight loss. There's not just a slight reduction in type 2 diabetes. There's actual reversal of type 2 diabetes or dramatic reduction. In, in other words, uh, it's the flawed reasoning that um, is widely used in, in uh, epidemiology and in nutrition. Yeah, and WIH, I mean, it was six, seven hundred million dollars, and it was there to prove the low fat theory and the healthy whole grains. And it must have been a, a huge disappointment when the whole thing fell on its face. But, but, but they deserved it. They deserved it. I'm going to actually switch, switch subjects back a little now because I don't want to forget this one. You have a paper that seminal, a study published 2008, and I've repeatedly sent it to people on the internet. It's one of the only published papers demonstrating regression of calcification. And you mentioned earlier it was vitamin D, fish oil, and at the time you were using lipid-lowering drugs as well. But I think you had 45 patients, around half regressed, around half were fairly stable, and a small percentage increased. So maybe talk a little about that paper, and it didn't get a lot of coverage out there, I believe. No, it's a small paper, and I'm guilty of not having updated all the strategies. If, if I were to update the, uh, the experience, it would show that uh, there's dramatic regression when you do these things. One of the problems, it's the same problem that people like Bredesen have. Bredesen is the, guy, is the end of Alzheimer's guy who he tried to get a, a approval. You have to get approval to perform clinical studies nowadays, appropriately so. 
you have to get through an institutional review board, an IRB. And uh, every time he tried to propose a study that had numerous moving parts, he got turned down because uh, it's, it's very difficult for these IRBs and other people to understand programs that have multiple moving parts, as opposed to a drug company study, say, which is Lipitor versus placebo or high dose Lipitor versus low dose Lipitor. But when we do real health studies, where in my case would have been the diet that eliminates expression of small LDL particles, vitamin D that reverses insulin resistance is anti-inflammatory, omega-3 fatty acids that's anti-inflammatory and has uh, effects on subduing postprandial after meal lipoproteins, magnesium that reverses endothelial dysfunction, causes reduction of blood pressure, iodine and thyroid optimization because of disruption of thyroid status in the world, and then cultivation of healthy bowel flora to correct the modern dysbiosis everybody has. Now, try to get that through an IRB. They'll say, no, no, there's too many things here. Though I know this works like crazy because we've done it so many times. <clears throat> but So you have to do studies that are kind of silly and stupid, like we're just going to do the diet or just vitamin D. And what happens when you do those things, of course, you, you may show a modest effect or no effect because the magic in a lot of this occurs with the synergies among different strategies that all contribute to a, a much more meaningful whole. So it's very tough. But nonetheless, that little trial I published, the retrospective trial, did show that it was at least conceivable, at least was feasible, to stop or reverse heart scan scores in a lot of people. I'll tell you, the experience is much more effective today. I've been uh, um, distracted by the whole wheat belly undoctored experience where we've, you know, as I, as I said to you before, people don't want to talk about heart disease. It's scary. I learned long ago that people are much more interested in money, weight loss, food, and sex. And so you got you to gotta get people's attention. So a lot of my message is not driven by coronary disease reversal. It's driven by Mary Jane, who can drop her dress size from a 36 to a 4 and look great in a bikini and uh, is, is 10 years younger because she lost her skin wrinkles and her eye puffiness. And so that's how humans, but then you, it's your opportunity now to educate them about coronary disease or cancer or high blood pressure or whatever. And so um, uh, because of that, I've gotten distracted and not republished or updated some of the, the data. But I can tell you at least anecdotally on a large scale, uh, regression of coronary calcium scores is relatively easy, and, and, but it won't involve a statin drug, a low fat diet or aspirin. The best, what they call optimal medical therapy which is laughable, of course. And again, I tend to avoid getting into the whole uh, pharmaceutical or drug discussion. I, uh, just because I rather focus on the root cause and the nutritional fixes, which you're all over. So regression, this is a key question. If someone does the right thing synergistically together, regression is possible. That it means a much more positive risk profile or future outcome, right? Yes. So if you achieve stabilization, that is no change or regression, uh, uh, heart disease events, heart attack, death, sudden cardiac death, rupture, um, development of angina is virtually zero. So you have virtually zero risk if you achieve that. Um, now, people say things like, well, if you remove calcium, you remove the stabilizing component of plaque. Well, one, that's ridiculous. Uh, calcium is not stabilizing. It's a consequence, not a cause. It's a consequence. And by the way, so having done, I have the advantage of having done thousands of intracarnary ultrasounds. And all that means is you actually put a, a millimeter wide probe down the, actually down the carnary arteries themselves over a wire. And you image the arteries in cross section. You see what they're made of. And you learn very quickly. There's no such thing as hard plaque and soft plaque. There can be, but most plaque is a hodgepodge. It's a smorgasbord of all kinds of things, just as you'd expect. It's got some calcium, it's got some soft elements, it's got some fibrous elements, it's got all kinds of different shapes and sizes and all, oval, round, I mean, all kinds of crazy things. So <clears throat> um, this idea that uh, removing calcium is somehow destabilizing is contrary to what we know. And that is when you reduce your score, you have zero, virtually zero events. And by the way, the idea that calcium is stabilizing is a speculation from people who apologize for the effects of statin drugs. That's where that came from. Because when you give people statin drugs, so we talked about how heart scan scores increase if you do nothing, 25% per year. If you give somebody a statin drug, heart scan scores progress even more rapidly, 27, 28, 30% per year. So the statin apologists say, oh, well, that's good because calcium is stabilizing. 
of course, that's ridiculous. It, why, would, why would calcium be the exception only in statin-treated people? So that's, that's complete speculation. It's probably wrong. But that's where that idea that calcium is somehow stabilized. It comes from the statin apologists. So regressing calcium as a surrogate for carnivore atherosclerotic plaque volume, not hard plaque, but all components of plaque, um, uh, is a wonderful thing. Regressing calcium is a wonderful thing. And it's also uh, uh, a great index of the effect you're having with vitamin D. Perhaps K2. Just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle-aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources. Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. Excellent, William. And then the regression, you, obviously from the published literature, there are papers from Raggy and others, uh, as you say, where people who stabilize their progression, even their risk plummets incredibly lower. But you've actually seen regressions. Is that in volume and density or general Agatston? It's both an Agatston score as well as the volumetric scoring. Um, we've not correlated the two. Is there a difference in some people who, let's say, get more Agatston reduction than volumetric scoring? So what, what we're talking about, of course, is volumetric scoring uh, is a little different. It's probably better than Agatston scoring, though Agatston still uh, persists, a density and, and uh, area score. So no one's really proven uh, beyond a doubt that one is better than the other. In truth, both are pretty good. Um, uh, but we, did ach uh, we do achieve regression in both. And it's relatively easy. It's the exceptional person who doesn't. You know, there's just genetic variation, of course, in a number of things. Such as, so even though small LDL particles reverse with the majority of people, in the majority of people who uh, eliminate all grains and sugars. And by the way, the reason for that is, it's just, as, you, as you know, carbs cause um, small LDL particle formation. And the, carb, uh, the carbohydrate of grains is amylopectin A, which is a, a really bad carbohydrate because it's so highly digestible by the enzyme amylose, amylase that it yields that big rise in blood sugar that fuels the liver conversion of carbs to triglycerides, de novo lipogenesis. That's why you get fatty liver. That's why you get hypertriglyceridemia, high triglycerides, and insulin resistance from consumption of grains because of the amylopectin A. As you would point out, the, the amylopectin A in white flour is the very same amylopectin A in whole grains. It's the same stuff. So the grain elimination is an exceptionally powerful and it, it doesn't seem like it, it's, it's not intuitive. Grain elimination is an extremely powerful cardiovascular protection strategy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the grains have a lot to answer for. And the regression then that, that you, regression in your patients, you have the clinical experience of seeing their progress. And I remember you once saying many years ago that you effectively don't see repeat heart attacks or repeat business. Uh, your whole practice changed. So you yourself have seen regression with this synergistic kind of implementation of, of root cause fixes. You've seen the regressions and the stabilization directly link to no future heart attacks or extremely low levels, way lower than will be expected. Yeah, it's anecdotal, but on a large scale, I had a very, very big practice. And um, it was very, I, I like other cardiologists, expected several heart attacks per week in your patients who you took care of. That is on a beta blocker, on aspirin, on a statin drug, on a fibrate drug, on blah, 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 blah. And you just knew that you'd be called three o'clock in the morning with heart attacks or recurrent chest pain angina in your own patients. Or you'd meet people, you'd have to do a procedure on them and they'd be back in six months. So part of uh, the theme of coronary disease is that it's, it's, it repeats itself over and over and over which by the way is a financial bonanza. If you're a cardiologist, if you're a stent manufacturer, if you're a hospital, you love that stuff because every time you, somebody comes back in, ka-ching, 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 not just for $10, but for thousands of dollars. You know, uh, uh, somebody comes in for three stents, the hospital and you make something like 80, 90, $100,000 comes in, they come in for bypass 
uh, the price tag starts at about 150000 So it's a huge financial bonanza to do these kinds of things. Well, I started to do all this stuff, wheat and grain elimination to eradicate small LDL particles and reverse insulin resistance, vitamin D, anti-inflammatory, omega-3 fatty acids at high dose, magnesium, et cetera. Heart disease came, that is coronary disease, came to a grinding halt. I went from three, four, eight procedures a day to essentially zero. Now, people who said, screw you, I'm going to smoke cigarettes, they continued to have problems. But people who said, oh, okay, this is interesting. You're showing me how I'm reversing small LDL particles. You're showing my C-reactive protein drop from three to zero. You're showing me how my HDL went from 32 to 98. You're showing me how my triglycerides dropped from 245 to 39. <laughs> In other words, we're showing them that the markers for coronary risk are undergoing a broad and powerful, profound change back to ideal or normal. And then along with, so that's how I convince people that, you know, stick with the program because they saw their markers improve and diabetics become non-diabetic type two, of course, people with uh, pre-diabetes became non-pre-diabetic, blood sugars dropped, hemoglobin A1C dropped. And of course, what people really want to see was, oh, and I lost 43 pounds. I now wear my jeans from 10 years ago, or I now fit back, the ladies fit back in a size four dress and they feel great about themselves. Um, even their shoes get smaller, their feet get smaller. So <laughs> there's all these surface changes as well. But along with that, is we saw a regression of coronary disease. And it makes sense because we're seeing this broad landscape of metabolic transformation and coupled with it is regression of coronary disease as well as other diseases. Yeah, and that's another point that they're all connected together. There's a common soil of causes of modern chronic disease as you laid out in uh, Undoctored. And of course, what you do to prevent or eliminate heart attacks and fix all the markers is going to greatly reduce the risk for cancers and many, many other diseases too. Uh, one thing we uh, had, or we've done a documentary and we've scanned around 45 middle-aged men, 58 years old approximately, prior sports stars. But in our documentary, we've seen certain regression phenomena and magnesium, low carb, use of a blood glucose meter and K2 and some other things were used. So we see these regressions and you would say that that means really good stuff, right? Absolutely. I love how we're all kind of uh, converging. So we're all starting to realize that the conventional notion of statin drug, low fat diet, aspirin is not only ineffective, but may even be harmful. And then you, me, David, Bob, and other people are realizing we're all kind of converging in the same kind of findings. That is, no, it has to do with diet, not a low fat diet though, vitamin D, et cetera. So uh, now they're, uh, and we're getting smarter every day. So one of the great insights, I think, into coronary disease, as well as so many other conditions, is the dysbiosis we've all experienced, the disruption of bowel flow. So Parkinson's disease is looking like a disease of dysbiosis. Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is looking like a disease of dys dementia, is looking increasingly like a disease of dysbiosis, and specifically, probably, if we believe the data is, it's flooding out of Spain, a disease of fungal overgrowth, interestingly, intestinal fungal overgrowth, but over, and coronary disease is looking like, not entirely, but to a large part, a disease of dysbiosis. And what, what that tells us then is then purposeful reconstruction of a healthy microbiome may be a key strategy in uh, reachieving control over such things as Parkinsonism, Lou Gehrig's disease, dementia, and, and coronary disease. Right. But William, you're talking about transforming the biome uh, through what you put in your mouth primarily. Yeah. Nobody knows what eubiosis looks like that is a healthy microbiome. It's, it's tempting to believe that the primitive cultures on earth who, who have never taken antibiotics, don't drink chlorinated water, have never been exposed to herbicides or pesticides, etc., like the like the Hadza of uh, Tanzania or the Matzas in the highlands of Peru and some other, a handful of other primitive cultures, they have had their microbiome characterized. And by the way, such as the Hadza and the Matzas on two different continents have almost identical uh, microbiomes, intestinal gut flora, suggesting that that may represent the microbiome that humans have had for millions of years, the so-called Stone Age microbiome. 
should we try to, and it looks completely different than ours. They had maybe more Prevotella, they have more Fusobacteria, they have more Parabacteroides, they have, and, and we have completely different bowel flora. Should we try to recreate their bowel flora? Well, no one knows. I, you know, I'd love for somebody to encapsulate some of the key species from one of those populations and deliver it to us as a, as a probiotic, and we give it a try and see what happens. Uh, no one's done that yet. Um, there's been sporadic efforts at fecal transplants doing that, which is kind of hazardous because those people may have other things going on too, like, um, like uh, pathogens, like uh, worms. <laughs> so there may be other issues here, but no one knows what a truly healthy microbiome looks like. So we're zigzagging little by little towards what is truly, but there are pieces of wisdom emerging. So before we started, before you start recording, we talked about this crazy thing I'm doing, this lactobacillus rotori yogurt that is restoration of a species that most modern humans lack now, but had, most of us had up until, all throughout history, up until the mid 20th century. So something, antibiotics, herbicides, pesticides, whatever, <clears throat> has eliminated this bacteria that we typically got from mother's milk during breastfeeding years when we were babies, but is now absent. Now here's something for you, lactobacillus ruteri, exerts all its age-reversing effects, like smoother skin, thicker dermal collagen, increased muscle, increased bone density, increased libido, increased testosterone, male. It exerts all those effects via a boost in hypothalamic release of oxytocin. What else does oxytocin do? It in increases empathy and a desire for connection to other humans and, and feeling good about other people. Well, I, I wonder then, is the lo loss of lactobacillus ruteri and thereby higher levels of oxytocin, is this part of the explanation to, to, to tell us why there's record social isolation, record suicide rates, record divorce rates, and who knows, maybe even gun violence in the US, which of course is out of control. <clears throat> so is this targeted idea that what we're doing is restoring lactobacillus rotori, and we're doing it specifically by making yogurt from the lactobacillus rotori. And people are saying, hey, you know, I, I feel closer to my partner. I, I understand the problems of other people more. So I wonder if we're gonna have an impact on the social fabric, not just health, by recultivating what we're supposed to have. But that's just one little piece of an answer to I think what's gonna be a very, very exciting collection of strategies for rebuilding our, our healthy microbiome. Yeah, William, I think it's going to be fascinating in the coming years, the whole microbiome and, and everything that you mentioned there. I haven't got into it much yet, but I'll be watching. Uh, we need more science on it and more proof. I think there's been quite a lot of science doing transplants that's been questionable. And it's also arguable that simply transplanting isn't enough, that you need to change the whole environment that cultivates the microbiome to actually get the effects but the microbiome it's kind of the second brain or the gut is the your other brain it's going to be an interesting times ahead <laughs> i agree one of the things i i love about it is uh the strategies to recultivate a healthy microbiome have nothing to do with big pharma <laughs> well well don't, don't even say that because if it becomes apparent to be important there will be loads of drugs to help your biome. <laughs> true, true. So one you mentioned several times, which I love, is magnesium. But you didn't get into so much some of the mechanisms. So because I'm so hot on magnesium myself, and I have a mountain of papers on it, it's uh, biochemical effects, the apparent uh, deficiency in the modern human race of magnesium, the depletion in the soils. Maybe we talk a little bit about magnesium because I kind of find it a super important thing to maybe supplement or at least ensure you get particularly high magnesium foods. Absolutely, I agree. Magnesium is huge. Uh, and as I, as, as I mentioned before, for me, the litmus test is to ask, did primitive humans get greater quantities of magnesium? And as you point out, yes, they did, because they eat wild plants that had much greater content of magnesium. Soil had more magnesium, not the uh, mineral depleted soil of commercial farming. Uh, they didn't filter their water. They went to the river or stream, and water's flowing freely over rocks and minerals, and it's rich in magnesium. We, of course, have to drink filtered water, whether your city filters it or you filter it in your home, 
uh, water filtration removes 100%, nearly 100% of all magnesium. And of course, if you consume grains, the phytates, the phytic acid content of grains binds most magnesium in your gut and you poop it out and you don't absorb the magnesium. So uh, all modern people have profound deficiencies and that has uh, 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 consequences. Bone is the repository for a lot of magnesium. And that's why people who are magnesium deficient have much more osteopenia, osteoporosis, and, and hip fractures. And one of the great benefits, of course, of magnesium repletion is a dramatic uptick in bone density and a reduction in, in fractures. So I agree, magnesium is huge. Uh, and we see such things as modest reduction in blood pressure, uh, reduction in arterial constriction, or so-called endothelial dysfunction. That is our, that's the process that leads to more atherosclerosis, hypertension, and coronary, cardiovascular events. So magnesium is an arterial relaxing uh, agent. It reduces, you know, when, in my uh, heart disease practice days, working in ICUs and coronary care units, et cetera, if someone came in with a heart rhythm disorder, like atrial fibrillation or multifocal atrial tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, they were a survivor of sudden cardiac death or torsade. These are all uh, heart rhythm disorders. First thing you do, mega dose magnesium. This is conve even conventional. <laughs> they get mag like three grams of magnesium sulfate. You can give mega dose 3,000 milligrams. We can't, if you did that orally, you'd, you'd have diarrhea for an extended period. Can't do that orally, but you can do it intravenously. <clears throat> and you restore magnesium, and you'll see it's dramatic. If they're having unstable heart rhythms, it, it goes back to normal within moments. That's how powerful magnesium is. But then you see all these other wonderful effects. And um, uh, so magnesium, and by the way, the way I do it, you may have noticed, is we do it with mag something called magnesium water, which is a little recipe I have for making magnesium bicarbonate by mixing, I don't know what you call it in Ireland, but we call it milk of magnesia here. Yeah. Okay. It's a laxative. It's magnesium uh, uh, oxide. Uh, I'm sorry, magnesium hydroxide. And we react it with carbonic acid. That is carbonated water, like seltzer water or something similar. And you generate water and magnesium bicarbonate. Magnesium bicarbonate is the most absorbable form of magnesium. You, you, can, you, can, you can't buy it. You have to make it. It's very easy. And anybody's interested in getting this extremely absorbable form of magnesium. It's, I put it everywhere. It's in my books, Wheat, Wheat Belly Total Health, Wheat Belly 10 Grain Detox, Undoctored. It's in my Wheat Belly blog. It's in my Undoctored blog. <laughs> the recipe for making magnesium water. I'll tell you a quick story. So I learned about the power of magnesium water when I had some patients way back when with something called magnesium-losing nephropathies. These are people who, for a variety of weird reasons, like having gotten cisplatin, a chemotherapy agent, and it, one of the side effects is it eliminates your kidney's capacity to retain magnesium. So these people pee out their magnesium, and no kidding, they're dead within a week from super-duper low magnesium. They just drop dead, sudden cardiac death. So these people end up going to the ER and acute care every five or six days or so for a magnesium infusion. And if they don't, if they miss a day or two or three, they're dead. That's how bad this was. Well, you can imagine <clears throat> what kind of effect this has on your uh, emotions, right? Your, your finances, it's very expensive to do that. And so I tried to devise a means to restore magnesium or at least reduce reliance on intravenous magnesium. Well, I give them all the tablets, right? High-dose magnesium uh, citrate, high-dose magnesium malate, high-dose chelated magnesium, all that stuff, nothing. No rise in magnesium at all. They remain completely dependent on magnesium intravenously. So I tried making this magnesium water, reacting magnesium hydroxide with carbonic acid to yield magnesium bicarbonate. And we'd, you drink, you start by drink, the, the proportions are in, my, in those places I mentioned. You start by drinking four ounces three times a day. These people did. You build up to eight ounces as tolerated because it does cause diarrhea still. Uh, and lo and behold, I got them off intravenous magnesium. It's the only thing I ever, ever got. So these poor people, I'd monitor their magnesiums like every three days in, in the beginning. And lo and behold, magnesium stayed up. And they didn't die, of course. <laughs> didn't have to get intravenous magnesium. So it was a very, very vivid illustration <clears throat> of the variation in absorbability of various magnesium. Not to say that tablets can't do the job. They can, but they're extremely slow, extremely poorly absorbed. So if you have a low 
either serum or RBC magnesium, you're going to have to wait two, three years to see a real effect. You take the magnesium water, you wait weeks, and it rises. And if you have magnesium-dependent phenomena, like leg cramps, which are very annoying, very painful, or heart rhythm disorders, or high blood pressure, or erratic blood sugars, or migraine headaches, uh, you'll get relief much faster with the magnesium water. That sounds like a great tip, William. Yeah, I have uh, one pound bags of magnesium citrate just because it was very easy to get. It's quite absorbable. But again, we mix it in with food or I take it in the evening after a large meal. Uh, I don't think it works too well with me on, a, on an empty stomach. <laughs> very uh, interesting idea. Never tried that. Great idea. Might help. But you, magnesium has an extraordinary amount of literature out there. It's just stunning uh, where it can be beneficial in so many conditions. Now, obviously, it's not promoted much because it's not patented and no one has any interest. But you mentioned osteoporosis. And what I repeatedly find when I research the calcification mechanisms at a fairly deep level is there's always an inverse relationship. You know, higher osteoporosis and calcium loss with higher deposition and calcification and magnesium is one of the nexus of that whole relationship that you know when you have an imbalance in magnesium or myriad other things that drive calcification the irony is you're losing calcium from your bones that's the pathology and you're building calcification in your arteries it's a very fascinating seesaw that nearly always applies yeah and as you know coronary disease uh often uh, occurs concurrently with uh, uh, osteoporosis, osteopenia. So there's a real connection via the vitamin D slash calcium slash magnesium disruption. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm conscious of your time, William, and I really appreciate this chat we're having, but I know you're going to run out pretty shortly. I'd like to just have a quick word again on the calcium scan and the whole philosophy around it. So myself and David Bobbitt, my sponsor, see it as a right to know. So the Widowmaker movie went through all of the controversy and why the medical system hated it. The drug manufacturers know it'll deprescribe people. The interventional cardiologists know it'll take away a load of patients who don't need angiograms, but they can give it them anyway. And there's all these other reasons. But it's fundamentally a right to know, we believe, that many people may choose not to find out their level of heart disease, but for the people who want to and to do something, isn't it such a shocking shame that people will go and die of a heart attack when there's a test that would actually tell them there's a problem and wake them up? Ivor, absolutely. I helped open one of the first heart scanners in the Midwest way back when, tw over 20 years ago. And back then it wasn't a multi-detector scanner, it was the old electron beam tomography device, a very excellent device, by the way, that GE scrapped and locked up the patents because of financial reasons. Nonetheless, we opened up one of the early heart scanners 20 some years ago, and you think the fight's bad now? It was very bad back then. But you know what? I, ironically, you and I, people like you and I and your listeners, recognize that CT heart scanning for a coronary calcium score is an enormously empowering measure. It's like getting a blood sugar or blood pressure. It tells you with precision, with accuracy, and trackability how much coronary atherosclerosis you have. There's no reason to not do it. There's modest radiation exposure, about eight to 10 chest X-rays equivalent, but it's modest and it gives you such enormous empowering information. But sadly, what's driven it is not that realization. It's that very quietly, the hospitals and my colleagues, the cardiologists, call CT heart scans a lost leader. In other words, they say, oh, David Bobbitt has a score of 1100 or whatever. He needs a stress thallium, that's $4,800. He may need a heart catheterization, another $38,000, $40,000. He needs a stent, another $60,000, $80,000 in the US. In other words, they see, and they often use the heart scan score as an excuse to do even unneeded procedures. They say, oh, Mr. Bob, you have a score of left. Very serious. You need the real test, a heart catheterization to see if you need. And even if David says, I'm jogging, I run, I have no chest pain. They say, well, we can't be responsible for your safety. It's a, you're a walking time bomb. You've heard all this stuff. My colleagues are very good at scaring the hell out of people. And then nice guy like David Bob, ends up with three stents and tied to the medical system because of recurrent disease bypass surgery that's that's what has sadly i've that's what has driven heart scans because now the hospitals 
So none of the hospitals would have anything to do with heart scanning 20 some years ago when I set up the first heart scan in Milwaukee in Wisconsin. But when, once they learned it was a lost leader leading to CT coronary angiography, heart catheterization, et cetera. Now the hospitals do heart scans and they say things like $99 and you'll know for a fact. And then you'll have to talk to a cardiologist who says, oh, Ivor, your score is 782, a very serious score. Maybe you need a stress nuclear study, heart catheterization. So that's what's driven it. So I, I say that because when people have a heart scan, it's wonderful. It's empowering. It's hugely helpful. But don't listen to the bullshit from my colleagues who try to use it as a upsell technique be very very skeptical of that yeah that's a great point and a warning too that people who find out about the calcium scan via myself yourself they're going to get the full picture with all those caveats about the medical business or if they watch the widowmaker movie they'll get to see how stents do not prolong life and they're a bit of a scam unless they're going to save a life in an acute situation. But you're right that the person who comes across the CT scan, the calcium scan, without having heard from myself, yourself or others, the realities, uh, they could be exposed to overtreatment for sure. And that's, that's just kind of a downside. But we still need to make progress and get the CAC scan out there widely to save the people who need it. And used properly. You know, I had this conversation every day one of my websites is called Undoctored Inner Circle, where people come and they say, hey, I had a heart scan score, it was 325, and, they, and I feel good, I, I ride my bike, I have no chest pain, I, I'm, I'm in perfect health otherwise, and my doctor says I need a heart catheterization to see if I need a preventive stent or bypass. This is a common occurrence. Even though we recognize that as malpractice, that is mal, it's very, I think it's less common in Ireland, but in the U.S., where healthcare is massively profit-driven, people are told every day they need unnecessary procedures, and so that's why we, when we talk about heart scans and how wonderful they are, how helpful, how empowering, and it's a trackable device you can follow along. We also have to say, but watch out for the nonsense that comes to scare the hell out of you into a procedure. Yeah, watch out for the upsellers and, and stick with the people. <laughs> if you put it simply, if you get a high score, you've got yourself a personal project to do to prevent your death. And you need to fix all the root causes. And there may be some medications that will stabilize plaque, whatever. But yeah, the operations and more invasive work is often not really needed. You've got your wake up call and now you need to go and take care of the problem. I think that's the, where the power is. Yeah. Absolutely. And the strategies that work, as you pointed out, to stop progression or actually achieve regression are easy things you can do in your own kitchen, like vitamin D, change your diet, magnesium, efforts to cultivate healthy bowel flora, etc. And just to recap, if you achieve regression by doing several synergistic key improvements to your life, it's all positive, right? Absolutely. There's no downside to achieving regression. Absolutely zero downside. Excellent. So is there anything else you'd like to add? I've, I've gone from memory here and I had a little list, but uh, is there anything else you'd like to add in at the end? Or I think we've got some incredible value from having you here today, William. Really appreciate it. Well, you know, I, I, I step back for a moment and I think what Ivor Cummins is doing today was unimaginable even 20 or 30 years ago. This smart engineer looks at the medical system and the conclusions they draw and say, this is a bunch of crap. I can't believe these people have fallen for this nonsense, largely because it's driven by big pharma. Uh, but this is, I love this. I love when somebody from outside the system disrupts what passes, uh, is being passed off as prevailing wisdom and says, this is not right. And you know, if we had 100 cardiologists here, probably 99 would disagree with everything you and I say. So you know, we, we don't want anybody to um, uh, underestimate just how important it is what you're doing, disseminating. You're not selling drugs. You're not selling a procedure. You know, you don't cash in for a hundred thousand bucks <clears throat> every time somebody has a heart scan score. You're telling what people, what you believe because you analyze the data without bias objectively and say, the stuff you're hearing on 
drug, drug ads or from your doctor is complete nonsense. Here's what the real story is. And I think this is wonderful. It's representative of the kind of power we have now being put in the hands of everyday people. And that's why, by the way, I called my book Undoctored because it showed me how people were becoming magnificently healthy despite the doctor, despite the doctor. Thanks, William. Yeah, I certainly enjoy this because I've always for decades loved going in and sorting out the data and finding clarity where there was confusion. Uh, but also, of course, David Bobbitt has enabled me with a sponsorship over the last few years to actually do this whole mission. So that's really the only way it's possible. And maybe a quick word to people, IHDA, Irish Heart Disease Awareness ihda.ie that has all of the resources in a few minutes on the home page and all the test centers around the world and it has a video of you as well actually second down from the top i believe okay. <laughs> which you were kind enough to do for david and a huge amount of information in those short videos so if people could proliferate that uh, that would really help us so i dr davis william Delighted to have this conversation, really enjoyed it. And I think we jumped all over the place and covered a lot of ground and uh, got to do it again soon. Absolutely, Ivor, anytime. Thanks a lot, William. Bye now. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.